Hey, I'm Rob Witcher from Destination Certification, and I'm here to help you pass the CCSP exam. We're going to go through a review of the major topics related to cloud audit in Domain 6 to understand how they interrelate and to guide your studies. This is the second video of Domain 6, which means that it's also the last video in our CCSP mind map series. I've included links to the other mind map videos in the description below. These mind maps are a very limited part of our complete CCSP masterclass. Auditing in the cloud is fundamentally different to auditing on-premises servers in many ways. Due to the immense complexity of virtualization in the cloud, a system could be spread across hundreds of devices and perhaps even multiple data centers. Even just a single virtual machine relies on a ton of underlying infrastructure. And in the public cloud, much of it will be shared with other tenants. Cloud providers generally won't let you audit their systems because it would put the privacy of other tenants at risk. So you have to rely on third-party audits. These are just some of the challenges of auditing in the cloud. There are a few particular audit challenges that you need to be aware of. One of these are immutable workloads. Auditing immutable workloads often requires entirely different test procedures. In a traditional environment, in order to audit, say, for example, the patching of servers across the organization, you could request an inventory of all the servers and then examine a sample of the systems to see whether or not they've been patched in a timely manner. Pretty simple. How's that going to work in the cloud, though, with immutable workloads? First, the population of servers is incredibly dynamic in the cloud environment. With VMs constantly being spun up and spun down based on dynamic optimization, etc. When it comes to immutable workloads, these can't be patched, right? They are immutable, so it makes no sense to test a sample and ensure they were patched in a timely manner. You need a completely different approach. In the example of patching immutable workloads, you often have to test the process of how images are updated and then deployed in a timely manner, replacing older unpatched immutable workloads. It's a totally different type of testing from you know, getting a population and then testing a sample of the population. Auditing infrastructure as code focuses on reviewing code, automated checks, and ensuring the consistency through the CI-CD process that continuous integration can use deployment process, which is very different than auditing traditional infrastructure and focusing on manual inspections, live environment checks, and handling configuration drift. The code-driven nature of infrastructure as code fundamentally changes how we audit infrastructure, and we need to use, again, very different techniques. However, done correctly, there are also potential benefits through early, consistent, and scalable auditing, making it more efficient and less error-prone than traditional infrastructure auditing. So I'm not suggesting it's all doom and gloom. <laughs> there, are, there are benefits to this, but you do have to significantly change your audit approach. And let's just focus on sampling again here. The traditional auditing technique of asking for a population and then testing a sample of the population is often no longer applicable in the cloud. We often have to move away from sampling. Instead, we need to test the processes that are used for example, the process used to update an immutable workload image and then ensure that image is deployed, replacing all the old unpatched workloads. Yeah, there's that example I gave again before. There are a few different audit approaches that can be employed. The first is internal audit, which is conducted by auditors from the organization on the organization's own processes. The purpose of internal audits is generally to assess internal controls, risk management, compliance, and operational efficiency. Internal audits help the organization improve processes and identify areas for improvement. Next is external audits, which is independent auditors from outside the organization, typically from an audit firm. External audits provide an objective evaluation of compliance with regulations and other requirements. External audits aim to assure stakeholders, such as investors, regulators, and the public, of the organization's accuracy and reliability of their controls. Finally, we have third-party audits, which are conducted by independent third-party organizations. For example, an audit firm like Deloitte. Importantly, this independent audit firm will not be affiliated with the audited entity, like a cloud service provider. The third-party auditor will conduct the audit of the service provider, much like an external audit, but the big difference is that the res audit results is a report signed off by the audit partner that is given to the service provider and the service provider can then hand that report out to their customers. This is how customers get assurance that their cloud service providers' security controls are reliable. 
So put simply, there are three parties involved. The auditor will conduct the audit and give the audit report to the service provider. And finally, the service provider can then hand out copies of the audit report to their customers. Unlike internal or external audits, third-party audits are usually specialized in certain compliance or certification areas, providing an objective, unbiased view on the audited entity's compliance with specific standards or frameworks, such as ISO 27001 or a SOC 2 audit. Uh, let's dig into these SOC 2 reports. They are super important to understand for the exam. Uh, SSAE 18 stands for the Statement of Standards for Attestation Engagement 18. And it's the latest standard for conducting SOC reports. SOC, by the way, stands for System and Organization Controls. Now, here's the really important part to remember. There are actually three types of SOC reports. SOC 1 reports are focused on financial reporting risks, and they are primarily used for financial auditors. As security professionals, we don't particularly care about SOC 1 reports. SOC 2 reports focus on the five trust principles, which are security, availability, confidentiality, processing integrity, and privacy. The five trust principles are most definitely of interest to us as security professionals. And a SOC 3 report is a summarized, sanitized version of a SOC 2 for public distribution. A SOC 3 report is basically a marketing tool. Okay, now just to make things a little more confusing, there are two types of both SOC 1 and SOC 2 reports. A type 1 report looks at the design of a control at a point in time. Essentially what the auditor is doing is simply reviewing some paperwork on say a Monday. Type 2 reports, they cover everything that a type 1 report covers, plus they look at not only the design but the operating effectiveness of a control. And not just at a point in time, but over a period of time, typically a year. The auditor, as part of a type 2 audit, are testing to see if a control was operating effectively over a whole year through sampling and other methods like testing processes that we talked about earlier. Type 2 reports are way more useful. So to sum it up, and this is what you should remember for the exam, what we as security professionals want is a SOC 2 type 2 report. That's the type of report we want from a service provider to get assurance over their controls. Okay, now let's talk about the different roles that may be involved in the audit and assurance function. Executive management provide tone from the top and promote and fund the audit process. The audit committee is composed of members of the board and other senior stakeholders who provide oversight to the audit program. The compliance manager manages the compliance program to ensure that the corporate compliance with applicable laws and regulations, professional standards, and so forth. So the compliance manager is managing the compliance program. Internal auditors are company employees who provide assurance that corporate controls are effectively managed. Internal auditors are conducting internal audits. External auditors provide unbiased and independent assurance. And they're, of course, independent of the entity being audited. So that's an external audit. And here we are. We have arrived at the final box in the final CCSP mind map. Gap analysis is basically a comparison of the actual security controls that are in place versus the desired controls. Common standards to compare against are things like ISO 27001 or the cloud controls matrix. A gap analysis is really important for helping an organization to identify their shortcomings against best practices. And there you go. That's an overview of cloud audits within domain six, covering the most important concepts you need to know for the exam. It also concludes our whirlwind mind map series. Hopefully this has helped you understand the connections between the many complex topics of the CCSB exam and will help you prepare to confidently pass the exam. Thank you.